Mike has spent endless hours protecting the integrity of the hill from people that want to put antennas and people that want to put uh, aqueducts and people that want to do all kinds of things. And, uh, and he's turned his attention a little bit to the history of the hill itself. And that means many of you. He's put together an event uh, that many of you took today to show you what we now understand of the hill from the archaeology to the ecology. And I think that the uh, presentation he'll give you tonight about many of your grandfathers or great grandparents should be a blast. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're lucky that Michael is uh, so committed to all of this. And uh, if any of you are interested in uh, further understandings of the University of Arizona's connection to the hill after the day, make sure you give me a call. I can be found on the web. I don't have cards, but just because, you know, immigration. And uh, <laughs> I, I just don't always find me on the web. <laughs>
came to Tucson among the Burton Bovee, and uh, it must have worked because later on, not too much later on, you see a picture of a bird on his horse, Old Babe. Um, he'd come to the right place, there's no question about that. And soon he was joined by his wife and his children, uh, Catherine and Daniel and Clara. Um, we had a bit of a housing shortage at the time. So the Bovee family pitched a tent on South 4th Avenue in Armory Park and took up residence. Uh, you can see the means of transportation here. It's very, very clear. Um, you know, I guess they were, the part that they were part of the 98%. <laughs> but, you know, a wall tent really doesn't amount to real estate. And I think his genes must have complained very, very loudly. Because the bird you see is the great grandfather of Tucson's renowned realtor's family, the Longs. Um, I must point out to you just that the other branch of the family, Roy Long, uh, came here also because of tuberculosis, but he came uh, almost 20 years later, I believe, than Bert did. And also, Roy didn't work for Tim Mockhill, and we're going to find out that Bert did. Uh, so that's why he gets to be in the story today. Um, anyhow, in 1903, assailed by his genes, uh, Bert his family moved into a proper homestead at 803 West Congress. I can tell you from personal inspection last week, it ain't there anymore. It's been, <laughs> it's been bladed. There's nothing but traffic um, and an empty lot there. Um, but, it, but it looked like that in the first decade of the 20th century. So, sick transit Gloria Bovi, I guess. I, I'm not sure uh, when it disappeared. Um, now we come to another branch of the story that starts in Washington, D.C. with a famous president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Now I'm going to be showing you lots of pictures of old dead white men. And <laughs> you probably know a little bit about what Theodore Roosevelt looked like, so I didn't bring one of those. Instead of that, I brought a picture of his great, great, great granddaughter, Rana, uh, that used to be my grandniece. And I figured I was entitled to a relative in this show, too. <laughs> now, of course, she is all her glory. Um, now, Roosevelt and his administration called themselves progressives, and they wanted to see basic scientific research advance in this country, but they had an ideological problem. Their problem was that they believed the federal government had no business funding basic research, only applaud. No problem, really, no problem at all, because Roosevelt had a good friend named Andrew Carnegie, and he was Mr. Megabucks, and he loved to do philanthropic things. So, with Roosevelt's collaboration, Carnegie founds an institution devoted to the support of basic scientific research called the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Still exists. Um, he populates the board, again, in collaboration with the president. Uh, he, co he populates the board with a mixture of crack scientists, and by the way, it's always been a scientist who's been the president of the Carnegie Institution. Crack scientists and political heavyweights. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and honest to goodness, um, William Howard Taft was on the board at one time. Uh, Elihu Root, who ran against Taft for the nomination of the Republican Party in 1904, six, whatever, um, was also on the board. And the two of them uh, were probably very close friends, uh, at least in this picture there. Hands look yeah. like they're almost touching. <laughs> and they were on the board of this place, along with a lot of other very fancy, very, very powerful people in Washington. We were like a national laboratory before there were national laboratories. Um, the board commissioned two very important, well-known botanists, Frederick Coville and Daniel McDougall, to go find a good site to put a laboratory 
where we could find out the answer to the riddle of how desert plants survive in the tremendous heat and drought that they face. How could they do it? Nobody had any idea. Well, neither Coville or McDougall had tuberculosis. <laughs> Nevertheless, they chose Tucson. There were good biological reasons for choosing Tucson. And the Desert Botanical Laboratory of the Carnegie Institution opened for business in October 1903. Now, if you look at a map, you'll see we're pretty close to 803 West Congress Street, remember 803 West Congress Street. And so pretty soon, Burton Bovey had a job here. He became a member of the staff. We don't know yet exactly when this happened. But it couldn't have taken very long. It was certainly in that first decade. And I'm going to tell you what he did later. But before I do that, I have to introduce another sicko. <laughs> this is a guy who was not an arth who was not tubercular, but an arthritic. Terrible, terrible case. I, from, based on his work that he did in the northeastern forests, I think he probably had Lyme disease before we had a name for Lyme disease. We do have letters in the Arizona Historical Society that tell us that his doctors diagnosed his condition as infectious arthritis. And we do know, we do know that in his middle 50s, um, he was racked with pain and severely debilitated. And naturally, of course, his doctor sent his flaming bones to Tucson. His name was Baldy Morgan Spaulding. And his wife, Effie, was also a botanist. Baldy was a famous botanist. He was a distinguished professor of botany at the University of Michigan with a lot of credits both in basic science and in outreach and in conservation. He was nationally known for his work to save the forests of the Northeast, which had dwindled to the point where, get this, white-tailed deer were so scarce we thought they were going to become extinct. There was no, there was no forest for them. And Spalding was at the forefront of the movement that eventually reversed that problem. But he was too he was too hurting to work anymore, and he had to come out here. Well, he did, just as the laboratory was opening its doors in October 1903. I have to tell you, there is no record that, that either Volney or Effie ever lived in a tent, at least not in Tucson. Uh, but they sure did get promptly to work in the Sonoran Desert. Effie's problem was that she wondered about the significance of the prominent ribs that you see on saguaro cactus. One of the things I want to do today is to give you an impression of the science that these people were doing, because it was extraordinary. And she was an extraordinary botanist in her own right. She looked at those ribs and she decided that she had, a, she had an idea uh, that she was going to pursue. She thought the ribs worked like pleats on a dress, which is to say they allowed the cactus to expand and contract they allowed the body of the Sahara to go in and out while avoiding the problem that the whole cast with his shirts and his pants. <laughs> it was not going to be any splitting open for those green body monsters. Um, why does she think that? Well, because Sahara cacti, cacti need to expand and contract. They have very shallow root systems. Something was also found out here. Most of what the world knows about saguaro cactus comes from this very hill. Um, and continues to come in, by the way. An active research program still going on here. And some other talk, we'll talk about that. Um, but not today. Uh, why do they need to expand and contract? Because the pleats would allow them to bulge with rainwater when it fell very rapidly in this shallow root system could pull the water in, the cactus expanded, it got bulgy, and it didn't break. It skinned and split open. And then it could gradually use the water 
and the, and the pleats would reappear, the ribs would get prominent again. Well, Effie actually took that hypothesis into the field, and there she is measuring the pleats. She also measured precipitation, um, and she proved her point. She published an important paper, one of the very first published on this hill. It came out in 1905, um, and um, nobody, ever, nobody ever wondered anymore about the ribs of saguaro cactus. Meanwhile, Volney had been deprived of his northeastern forests. You know, he wasn't in such pain anymore, but what was he going to do? He decided that he would get with the team, and he would begin to explore the physiological questions of how cacti and other shrubs and other kinds of plants in the desert managed to survive in such heat and with so little water supplies. Well, that didn't last long. By about a year and a half afterward, in the spring of 1905, Spalding sends a letter to the bosses of the Carnegie, and he says, I've been doing all this work. This is dated Witch Creek, California, where he was uh, for, for his arthritis at the time, July 28, 1905. Uh, and he writes none other than McDougall, remember, one of the co-founders of the laboratory. And he says, so by the way, you know, I've made all this progress on your side, but I've decided to do something different. I've begun to make extensive surveys of the plant life of this hill in all its different habitats. And I think that we could do worse than to commit ourselves to a long-standing environmental study of how these plants interact with each other of how these plants manage to survive as a community. And I've put all these studies in as many different kinds of habitats on this hill as possible. He counted, he counted 12. Somewhere I have a copy of his, his book from 1909. This is the first edition, Distribution and Movement of Desert Plants. Uh, you can get one too. I got this very recently in the book market. I mean, it's it, modern looking for books is just great with, with computers. I would have spent my life looking for that. Now you just go and two or three days later you've located it. Um, it's a spectacular book. It's the work of a real dedicated scholar. And he was, he was hooked. And in this letter, he tries to hook McDougall, who was not really interested in this very much, but he let Spalding have his head. Um, and this is a long letter, but I, I, I've extracted just a little bit of it, this part that says, it took me a long time to learn how to read his handwriting, by the way. Last spring, in accordance um, with Dr. Cannon's wish and my own conviction of its necessity, uh, I spent some weeks making a preliminary and necessarily very incomplete botanical survey of the laboratory hill. Etc., etc., etc. And then he talks about how he's not going to see it finished. He's going to have to finish his, his career pretty soon because he's hurting pretty bad. Uh, but he wants, to, he wants the Carnegie to commit itself to this project. And they did. In 1906, we get the first data from these plots. And we still have some nine of the 19 plots that he set out. To this very day, we have nine of Volney Spalding's plots with the original iron stakes in the corners. They are the world's oldest permanent ecology study plots. The world, not North America, not in the desert, the world's oldest permanent ecology study plots. And we are still taking data from them. And we still find surprises because we've been at it so long. We we're able to learn things that you couldn't learn in the term of, say, an NSF grant. There has to be an institutional commitment of the sort that the Carnegie afforded back in 1906 and that is continued to this day by the College of Science of the University of Arizona. That's what it takes. Um, Well, there was a problem, though. I didn't tell you about the problem. And the problem was that Tumamak was overrun 
by domestic animals that grazed and browsed the vegetation that Spalding was trying to study. Cattle, horses, burrows, goats. Without permission, they were eating Balmy Spalding's plants. And he didn't like it. He was not amused. So he got an idea. Simple idea. In practice, <coughs> it was very difficult. The lab would put up a fence, a fence over five miles long, that would surround the entire scientific reservation all 860 acres of it. Then it would kick out the grazers, it would kick out the browsers, and while it was at it, it would also kick out all the quarrymen who were collecting building stones on Tumamak Hill. The natural vegetation of the hill would reestablish itself in time, and Tumamak scientists would get to study the process of recovery and the interactions of the species after recovery. Now, again, I'm going to introduce you to Godfrey Sykes later, but I have to tell you that one of Godfrey Sykes' first duties when he arrived at the lab in 1906 was to build that fence. <laughs> it took 20% of the entire budget of this place that year, including salaries, to build that fence. I have the, I have the, the, the bills that specify the materials that went into it none of which is, is left. They were cedar posts, by the way. Some 35 years later, Godfrey Sykes wrote, and I quote, I had to survey and fence the tract of 800 acres of mountain and mesa land, which was to form the domain of the laboratory. The plan was to fence this against intrusion of any kind, either by stock or predatory wood or stone haulers, in order that the area might revert during a course of years to its original condition of natural development. It doubtless now, after a lapse of 35 years, because Spalding wrote this uh, at the end of the Second World War, it doubtless now approximates very, very closely as regards vegetation, surface drainage, and so forth, to the condition of the region when the Spaniards first entered it." Unquote. So you see, what you see around you that you think is pristine, untouched desert, is here because of the vision of Valmy Spalding and the commitment of the Carnegie Institution to see it through. This is recovered desert. This is restored desert. In fact, Spalding's idea has recently been recognized as a revolutionary idea marking the very creation of the concept of restoration ecology. Giving nature back what we previously took and giving it back with no ulterior motive other to enjoy her beauty, study her ways, and perhaps assuage our consciences in an act of atonement. Perhaps. That sounds like Carnegie. Um, the Carnegie got results within three months. They began to see increases in the vegetation within three months. And they recorded the same in the annual yearbook of the Carnegie Institution in, at the end of 1906. Today, the idea of restoration ecology has spread throughout the entire world, but he was born here on Tumamak Hill. And it's one of the reasons that we are a national historical landmark. Now in the summer of 1904, um, another Tumamak character, Francis Lloyd, who was a professor at Columbia University, no less, came to Tumamak, supported by a small research grant from the Botanical Society of America. Uh, Lloydie left his wife Mary to endure an eastern summer, and I grew up there, and I know they're not very pleasant. And he came to the Sonoran Desert, where he encountered an even hotter one in the tents of Tumamakville. Uh, here he is, outside his own tent, And uh, 
He's blobbing flapjacks. This is a picture from the Long family, by the way. I don't know that anybody in the White family has ever seen this picture before. You have. Okay. Well, I had. I was just shocked. I was shocked. And I want you to notice something. In the background here, I mean, here's the here's the flapjack right here. It's up in the middle. <laughs> and in the background, there's this tall, skinny fellow holding up the tent. Carry <laughs> on, and that's Bert Bovey. Yeah, he's, he's looking on, and he's letting young Flapjack Francis play the part of chef. Uh, and uh, I've left a page out, a very important page, and I'm going to just um, move to that particular page and tell you uh, what Moiti did, why he was here. Um, but before I do, I will mention the fact that in 1906, he came back again to continue his studies, this time with his family, because, in fact, McDougall had convinced him to resign from Columbia University and accept a full-time position on the staff of the Desert Botanical Laboratory. Um, but there, you know, there was still that little problem with the housing shortage. <laughs> And, uh, and so they wound up living in a tent in Tillamontville at the foot of this hill down there, along with a lot of other people. And there's Mary. Um, and you see her pots and pans. She's very seriously uh, involved in, in, I don't know, bird watching. I'm not sure what she's doing here. Um, I want you to notice a couple of things, however. And uh, if I can correct the printer problem I have here. Um, there we are. Yeah, two things. First of all, I want you to notice how impeccably dressed she is. I mean, the lab workers, especially the scientists and their wives, wore clothing that we wouldn't dream of wearing in Tucson, <laughs> even to our granddaughter's graduation. The second thing you need to notice about Mary is that she's pregnant. Living under those circumstances, in a nice, friendly environment, I'm sure, but uh, it was hot, and she's pregnant. Now eventually, not very long, the Lloyds were able to rent the house that today we call the Cannon Douglas House, and should be called the Cannon Lloyd Douglas House. And there's Mary outside the house, it's still here, it's an olive in Olive, uh, just north of Speedway. Uh, it's an historical place, and uh, uh, Brooks Jeffrey, who's who helped us earlier in the Guardian tour has been involved very much this past summer in helping to refurbish this place. Um, but it's still there, and I've taken pictures of it as it exists today. Uh, lots of pictures, I don't have time to show you. But if you saw that picture, you would Im immediately recognize that house. It hasn't been touched. It is still there. And that's where the Lloyds lived, and that's where their first child, Francis Jr., was born. And I want to tell you what he did. What Francis Ernest Lloyd did is absolutely remarkable, especially considering how quickly he did it. Um, he was a physiological botanist, and he knew that the leaves of plants, especially the lower surfaces, there are exceptions, are full holes. Plants breathe. But they don't have mouths. They have these holes in the bottom of their leaves. And those holes go by the Greek name stoma, which means mouth. So maybe plants do have mouths, but they call, they're called stomata. That's the plural, stomata. And they look like this. Here's the undersurface of a leaf. And you see all those little holes that are in it. Um, and each one of them is surrounded by a pair of special cells called guard cells. And 
what happens is that air exchange occurs through those holes with air that has lots and lots of water on the inside of the leaf. This is a cross section through the leaf. That's the top of the leaf, that's the bottom of the leaf, and this here's the scientist's razor blade that's come down and cut that and made a nice picture for us to see. Um, and the water leaks out through the stomata. And meanwhile, the plants have to have carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis and produce starches. And they do it by opening their stomata, and in comes the carbon dioxide. But they can't have it both ways. I mean, they can't let carbon dioxide in and not lose water. So sometimes the stomata are open, and sometimes they are very, very close to being totally closed. And there's no gas exchange in, 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 in back and forth. Um, and Lloyd wanted to know, what's going on? How did they do that? And in particular, he recognized that in the desert, it's really important for them to avoid all that water loss. They've got to, they've got to photosynthesize, but, but they can't stand that water loss. So maybe there's special things going on in the desert. Out he comes, and he starts doing some absolutely spectacular work. Work that exists and lasted, and it's part of the explanation to this very day. I'm going to show you the explanation right now. These are his own microphotographs uh, from the Carnegie yearbook in 1906. Um, and the, the laboratory has a, a copy of that very yearbook. In fact, I took these pictures from there. And the uh, owner of this particular copy signed it on the front page. His name was Baldy Spalding. So this was Baldy Spalding's copy. And another very important uh, worker here, Walter Phillips, who came, comes much later, and we won't talk about Phillips, also signed it. So this is the issue of the yearbook that describes the plots that Spalding set out that found in restoration ecology and that shows the results that Lloyd got that helped the world understand how plants breathe. All in, I don't know, 20 or 30 pages and there's a lot less uh, of that, of those two stories. A very productive group of people. Very, very productive group of people. And here's the story. What he discovered was that each of the pairs of guard, the pair of guard cells, were full of starch bodies, those black things. And he was able to figure out how to stain them in life, so that he could tell when they were present and how big they were. And he discovered that the starch bodies were produced at night, and they peaked in their bulk um, just before the sun went up. And then after the sun rose, they rapidly diminished so that, especially in a warm summer day, there was hardly any starch in the guard cells. That's this condition right here. You can see that it's almost gone. Um, and it, and the, the stoma closes up, gets much, much smaller. Whereas in a cool spring day, when there wasn't so much problem with water loss, there still were a lot of uh, guards, uh, guard cells that had lots of these starch bodies, and the stoma was much bigger allowing for more gas exchange and more water vapor exchange. Now that explanation of the starch bodies changing the, the stiffness, actually, of the guard cells and allowing them to stay open because they were turgid, because they were stiff. On the other hand, losing this starch and becoming limp and having the stomata clamp down that explanation stands to this very day. Now, yes, we've made some little progress. And if you go to textbooks today, you're going to find out that those starch bodies are actually <coughs> cellulose microfibrils. You can see those lines right here. Um, and we understand the ion exchange that allows them to come and go and allows the guard cells to become turgid or to go limp. But it's all, it, it, it is, in fact, um, Lloyd's explanation. It is the result of his research. It's, and here's a, we have now a first edition of his book that came out in 1909 on the physiology of stomata 
um, which took me about a year to get. This is a little harder, even on the internet. Um, and um, it, 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 it just amazes me, because as a scientist, I see ideas and work come and go. It's so, it, it's so fragile, and it's so ephemeral. And for somebody to come, occur, to come up with this kind of work and have it last for a century and be re-emphasized and refined and improved for a century is just amazing to me. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, well, I'm trying to put this thing back together again. Uh, from bad printer experience. I think it's now time for, for me to, to let you know a little bit about Godfrey Sykes and introduce you to Godfrey Sykes. Time has come. Um, I think he may have been the most indomitable, multifaceted, Tumamuk Hill character of I mean, all absolutely everybody who's ever been here. I'm still learning things about him. I am still awed by what this man was able to do. Godfrey Sykes and his brother were both born and raised in Britain. In fact, their father was a well-known artist whose work hangs in the Victorian Albert to this day. Uh, I've heard uh, a boyer tell me that she thinks that sitting on Queen Victoria's lap in one of those pictures that, is, that her great-great-grandfather painted. Yeah, may very well be Godfrey Sykes himself, uh, but he's not identified. We have some other pictures, however. Um, he, the, he and his brother decided that they were going to cow punch their way across the American West. And uh, they had an early lifetime of adventures. There's no question about it. Finally, he and his wife and his brother bought a ranch in Flagstaff where they founded and presided over a sort of intellectual drinking club called the Busy Bees. <laughs> <laughs> Membership uh, in the Busy Bees was open to pretty much anyone with an interest, even if you were just a passers, passerby, you could come in. And on one occasion, <coughs> one of the passersby, uh, just a, a little bit a year or two before the Desert Lab was founded, um, was none other than Daniel T. McDougall. The two of these guys simply hit it off. There's no other way to do it. They became very close friends, very interested in each other, and each other's causes. Then Mrs. Sykes came down with heart disease, unfortunately. Well, so far we've got tuberculosis, <laughs> right? Um, and arthritis. And now we're going to get our, and now we're going to get a bad case of heart disease. Because Flagstaff sits at 7,000 feet above sea level, and we're not anywhere near that high, so the 7,000 feet was not so good for her. She had to get herself down to a lower elevation. At the same time, Daniel McDougall needed to hire somebody to supervise the new building and infrastructure projects that he was undertaking right here. So he figured, why not ask his good friend Godfrey Sykes? Superlative choice. Godfrey Sykes could figure out how to do anything and then do it superlatively. So the Sykes family, including its two sons, descended to Tumamak Hill, where they lived in a tent. I don't have a picture of that. But they lived in a tent for a very long time. And I know because Godfrey Sykes told me so. It's him. Um, among the things Godfrey Sykes did was to give a common name to an extraordinary plant called the Boojum tree. Uh, and he was wandering the desert with his research party one day and came over a hill and there were these crazy looking guys. They're related to Ocotinos. In fact, today they're put in the same genus, Bucavia. Uh, and he looked at it and he said, that must be a Boojum. And the name stuck. And we call them Bujib trees. In, in, in uh, Spanish, they're Cirio, C I R I O, Cirio. But he did many more substantive things than name Bujib trees. 
He supervised, as you've heard, the, the construction of our ecology fence, our restoration ecology fence. Uh, the building you're sitting in right now is the oldest part of the lab. This was put up in 1903. That side of the building, the eastern half, Godfrey sucks. He did that. He uh, also supervised the construction of the very difficult road that leads up to Mount Wilson Observatory in California. We, we lent him to Mount Wilson so that he could do that. And he was, he was the boss. He was the chief engineer. He hired the labor and supervised everything that went on there. And he described some of the trials and tribulations of getting that road built. It was not easy. In 1912, he welped another building, which is the chemistry building right over here. Um, and that is an interesting story of academic politics, but I won't tell you about that. Um, but he built it. And not least, Godfrey Sykes also supervised the construction of our boathouse at the base of the hill. Now, you know, today, you know, kind of everybody accepts the fact that a laboratory surrounded by desert has to have a boathouse. <laughs> I mean, it's common knowledge, right? But in 1907, nobody thought so. So I have to tell you what happened. Uh, what was going on. It, 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 it's really a, a fascinating story. At the beginning of the 20th century, some idiotic hydrological federal engineers made a terrible mistake, and they diverted the water of the Colorado River, all the water of the Colorado River, into the Salton Sink in California. Um, in 1906, McDougall and Sykes and the Spaldings went to see what was going on. And basically, all the desert vegetation was drowning. It was a surprise. They didn't publish that research. <laughs> uh, here is a map drawn by an expert geographer and cartographer, G. Sykes. Those of you with excellent eyes who can make 90 degree rotations and things. We'll see it says compiled by G. Sykes right down here. Uh, we'll see this is the Mexico-California border. And so north is to your left. Here's the Sultan, which is now not the Sultan Sea sink, but the Sultan Sea. Uh, the Colorado River, which uh, is up here. It's where the water belongs. Okay, But it had been diverted all the way down here through the Alamo River and through the New River and it was pouring into the Salton Sea, drowning the vegetation. Well, in, the, in those days, a major focus of ecology was called succession, plant succession. How do plant species first colonize and then replace each other in a new patch of landscape? This looked like a perfect opportunity. Those plants were all dead. But the people from the Southern Pacific, the engineers from the Southern Pacific, had figured out how to stop the water flowing in. They worked on it, and it was now clear that the water was going to go down, and the Salton Sea would again become the Salton Sink. So old people around here got really interested in going there and watching the vegetation come back to the places which were now going to be dry. In fact, the sea peaked in February of 1907, and soon after that, they arrived. Well, it wasn't quite so soon after that, because there was a little problem. If you're going to investigate a, a sea, or even a lake, uh, a lake, this lake, covered 500 square miles, it was 80 feet deep, and its circumference was 150 miles. That's not a big sea, but you still need a boat. And they didn't have a boat. <coughs> They didn't have a boat, no problem. Godfrey Sykes, he knows how to build boats. He's a Brit. All Brits know how to build boats. Besides, he built some boats in the, in, and sailed in the Colorado River. And so they sent him to the Salton Sea by himself with only some light camping gear and a box of carpenter's tools. <laughs> he camped on the edge of the sea. And pretty soon, he built himself a flat-bottomed sailboat with one sprit sail. Don't ask me what that is. 
Um, but I'll show it to you. I think I'll show it to you. Yes, I will show it. Here they are. Tumamak Hill Navy. <laughs> Floating in the Salton Sea in Godfrey Sykes' sailboat. That may be one of, one of them, may very well be Sykes himself. He participated heavily in the research. And um, they spent a couple of weeks. As soon as he got the boat built, he telegraphed the people. And they came out with their gear, their scientific gear, and lots of food to eat and other supplies. They got off the railroad and, and they started working. And it took them two weeks to circumnavigate the entire sea, during which time they were collecting all kinds of specimens and taking all kinds of copious field notes. And then they were done. So what should they do with a sailboat? <laughs> it's a reasonable question. They had no way to bring it home. There were no trailers. They didn't even own a car at this point in the history of the lab. What should they do with a boat? Well, the always imperious Daniel T. McDougall noticed a farmer walking by in the distance. And he, you know, said, come on over here a sec. He said, how do you like this boat? Not only can you have the boat, but you can even have the leftover supplies that are still inside the boat. Take it and it's yours. The farmer's homestead had recently been flooded. He had nothing else to do. So he said, sure, he gets in the boat, sails away. First, of course, they took out their gear and their samples and their notes. They didn't waste their trip at all. Um, you know, I can almost hear Sykes complaining. I can almost hear McDougall answering. Oh, don't worry, you can always build another one. And he was right. He was right. Um, he built more than one, in fact. He built a steel-hulled powerboat. He built a lot of kayaks. But he had also learned his lesson. Before he built another boat for these expeditions, he built a boathouse. <laughs> and here's an early photo of the boathouse. You can see one of the kayaks sticking out the door. Uh, by that time, there were a few cars around here, in fact all of which were Sykes' responsibility to maintain, by the way. Um, and uh, and uh, the Desert Laboratory research team returned again and again to the Salton Sea over a 15-year period, collecting an immense amount of data, an immense amount of good science that was done there uh, because Mr. Sykes knew how to build the boat. <laughs> now, in the meantime, Mrs. Sykes had passed away from her heart ailment. And their two sons, orphan sons, who were living in a tent. We know they were living in a tent. We don't have a picture, but we have the words of, of Godfrey Sykes himself. And uh, you could wonder, what, you know, what happened when, when these orphans were there and dad went away to go floating on the Salton Sea? Um, no problem. No problem. He simply left them alone. They were 7 and 11 years old, and he left them alone. He left them to tend their cats and their pet chickens, and he left them. Today we'd probably sick Child Protective Services on the guy and remove his children from his custody. You know, he was obviously a failure as a father. But maybe not. Um, Sykes did arrange for his children's meals, and after all, the kids were completely comfortable in their Sonoran Desert wall tent, in the shadow of the wings of protection offered by the community of Tumamaku. Um, now, speaking about the imperious Daniel T. McDougall, Voidy had attracted his attention by a lot of hard work and obvious success. And in 1906, it was McDougall persuaded Lloyd to uproot himself, to resign from Columbia University bring his wife, move to Tucson, and accept a position on the staff of the Desert Botanical Laboratory. 
Now you already know that there was no place to live when they got here, that they pitched a tent on the hill. Um, and you already know that eventually they were able to rent the cabin house. And you know that Francis Jr. was born there. What you don't know was that just a few months after he was born, the Lloyds were forced to leave Tucson, Arizona, to Mamonk Hill, and move to Mexico. What a piece of work Daniel T. McDougall was. He forgot something. He forgot to tell Francis Lloyd that he, Daniel T. McDougall, had enough money to pay Lloydie's salary for only six months. <laughs> now I can't imagine, I just can't imagine, I can't imagine how a moral human being can provoke the uprooting of a family when he knows that they'll have to move on to wherever in six months. But that's what happened. They do it all the time now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I tell you, not in academics, not yet. <laughs> McDougall, however, must have had profound insight into the character and talent of other people. Because as we saw in the brief time that Lloyd spent in Tucson, uh, he discovered how plants regulate the openings of their stomata, and that, that was a discovery that was significant for all botany, in and out of all the deserts uh, and other habitats of the world. Deprived of his position on the lab staff, the Lloyd family moved to Mexico where he uh, studied a small Mexican rubber plant. Uh, the company that hired him hoped to find out how our continent, the Americas, uh, could produce its own rubber. Because in those days, you see, um, rubber played a role like petroleum does today. We were totally dependent on foreign supplies, and it was a critical resource. Um, I found a signed copy of his book on his results, which I also have here, if you want to see it later, it's called Mayule, and uh, this one is uh, actually dedicated to his Aunt Jenny. The family found a picture of Aunt Jenny, which I also have, I'm not going to show you that, but uh, it's a good looking family, I'm going to tell you. Um, and this is just a spectacular treasure, to actually be able to hold something that he did like that. And, that he put his name to. Um, after Mexico, he became a professor in Auburn, and then a very distinguished professor with an endowed chair at McGill University, from which he did many, many great scientific uh, researches and books, and I uh, can't, uh, we are so proud of this man. We just are so proud that he was, a, that he did his signal work on Stamata at Tulumokyo. Well, now you might ask, what was Bert Bovey doing when he wasn't forced to stand there holding up Lloyd's tent? <laughs> I love that. We don't have to guess. It turns out that the answer is recorded in a controversy between Daniel McDougall, the same, and the president of the Carnegie Institution, Dr. Robert Woodward. President Woodward must have been a skin flint because he often thought that the lab was taking advantage of the Carnegie. And he complained a lot about the money that was being spent here. In May 1911, he got upset because McDougal was paying Bert Bovee $55 a month. <laughs> that wasn't a lot of money even then. What in heaven's name could Bovee be doing to earn that kind of money. McDougall answered him. Answered him on the 22nd of May, 1911. And he held his temper. And so we know what he did. <coughs> Quote, we employ Mr. B. R. Bovey as a general factotum, janitor, and messenger, who with his saddle horse rides to all of our buildings and structures here early every morning, giving us a half day service at the rate of $55 per month. He accompanies all mountain expeditions with his horse as packer, and when thus giving the entire day, renders an account for extra services. This has proved an excellent arrangement 
in every case, unquote. Well, here's a photograph of a three mule pack train up high in the Catalinas near Marshall Gulch. Uh, one of those guys is Bert Bowie. We don't know which one. Not yet. Uh, maybe we'll send it to NCIS and they can figure it out. <laughs> but one of them is him, and this is what the pack trains look like. This, that's a pretty extensive trip for those days. There was no road at that moment. Um, but I have another photograph. And here I do know. There's Bert. There's Bert doing his job, cooking breakfast, uh, as he accompanies two famous laboratory scientists on their expedition into Marshall Gulch up in the Catalina Mountains. Um, and those two people are far Shreve. So this has to be after 1910, this picture and his wife, Edith. Now again, I want you to notice two things about the, the Shreves. Um, I mean, Bert's doing his job, and uh, he looks kind of like what you'd expect for a field, on a field expedition. Uh, at least that's the way I look in the field. But the Shreves are impeccably dressed. They remind me of Mary Boyd. <laughs> that's the first thing you should notice. The second thing you should notice is how much they are in love. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen two people, young married people, sit so close together? It's a disgrace. Well, uh, I just want to finish up with a, a couple of. Final stories. In 1909, Spalding's arthritis was just too much to bear. Um, he checked into a sanatorium at Loma Linda in California. And we have one picture from the National Archives of uh, him in a wheelchair with his wife, Effie, by his side, and an attendant, uh, uh, not Bert Bowie. <laughs> um, and, and, and eight years, nine years later, he was gone. Um, and just shy of his 70th birthday. Effie, on the other hand, resumed her career as a plant pathologist. She became a professor at USC, a very famous professor, in fact. There she is later in life. Um, uh, she is <coughs> featured, in, in fact, it was her record that allowed me to get that picture of Holly and she together in Loma Linda. It's in the National Archives under her name, not his. Um, Godfrey Sykes, meanwhile, um, kind of almost given up maintaining cars. This is an interesting picture. It's from his, his, his own book. And you see that wheel? That's not a Studebaker wheel. That's a wheel <laughs> he built out of odds and ends. Um, and these cars had no roads to go on. They would just say, I want to go to that hill. And they'd point the car in that direction and just go. And as Sykes puts it, you know, you had to have a lot of nuts and bolts and bailing wire with you, and, uh, and then you, you eventually you would, you would get there. Um, but but um, in any case, um, when he and his wife were not trying to live in an English village, rather unsuccessfully, um, they were in Tucson, and they came back to Tucson after a while. But he came back quite decorated for his service in helping to develop the gas mask that protected Allied soldiers during World War I. He was honored with membership in the uh, British Institute of Mechanical Engineers. For his basic research in his efforts in geography and mapping and the study of mud formation in deltas, he was elected to membership in both the Royal Geographical Society and the American <coughs> Geographical Society. Uh, he left us a remarkable book of memoirs, which is still in print. And if you don't think there's something fun to read left, get a hold of A Westerly Trend by Godfrey Sykes. Um, it's still in print. When he lost his leg at age 83, uh, he got tired of a wheelchair pretty quick. And he went out and got a ponderosa pine lamp, and he made himself a new leg. 
himself. And then he went out to the car and he redesigned the car so that he could drive with one foot. 83. He also kept on swimming too. An amazing guy. And, and Burton Bovey's importance to the Hill Brewing Group. Bovey collected only one plant specimen that I could find during his many years on the Hill. And I had help from the herbarium the university to look for them. Um, it was a shrub that he collected in Marshall Gulch, and it's now held safely in our herbarium. His real biological passion was beetles, which happens to be a fondness he seems to have shared with God, according to uh, J.B.S. Haldane. I mean, a, you, you don't know that story because you're not an evolutionist, but there's a, a famous story of Haldane, who was an atheist. A, not only an atheist, but he was on the radio, an irregular program. He was, he was like the Rush Limbaugh of atheism. <laughs> And um, somebody thought it would be fun to sit him next door to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was not an atheist. At least not then. <laughs> and you're supposed to talk to your, your neighbor in the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, uh, famously turned and tried to be polite. Um, Haldane was probably never polite. Uh, and he, he said, so Professor Haldane, what do your researchers teach you about the nature of God? <laughs> and Haldane snapped at him. He must have an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Bert Bovey, too. He had thousands in his collection, beautifully mounted. Beautifully mounted. Um, but they didn't have any data. He didn't have the scientific training to know how to associate data with them. So they were of some value, and they were quite beautiful to look at, but they were of less scientific value than they could have been. In any case, Barge Shreve tried to see them protected as a collection, and he was, I read uh, papers of his, letters of his back and forth to the American Museum in an attempt to save the collection and have it housed in New York City, um, and also in Philadelphia at the Academy of Natural Sciences. But before that could be arranged, the collection disappeared. It was disposed of by his family. We don't know what happened to it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was his real passion. Um, on the other hand, we still have to leave it to Daniel McDougall. Because in 1920, McDougall absconded to a place that some of you know pretty well called Carmel, California. <laughs> but he didn't want to give up his directorship of the Desert Lab. So he tried to run the desert lab from, what is it, seven, eight hundred miles away, and this is 1920. The first jet plane was very primitive at that time. <laughs> How did he do it? Through Bert Bowie. Bert Bowie was the de facto director of this laboratory from 1920 to 1930. During the eight years, that McDougall held on, and then the first two years of Farish Treves' tenure as director of the laboratory. The real guy in charge was Bert Bovey. Um, I spent a couple of hours reading, just delighting in reading, correspondence between him and McDougall during the 1920s. As McDougall tried to keep his finger on the pulse and Bovey is trying to take scientific measurements and send them back to McDougall so McDougall can, uh, can know what to be interested in and whether he should ever come to Tucson again. Uh, and I just singled one of these letters out. And, uh, it's, it's a little, it's a lot of fun. It's a typical example in many ways. And it's dated from uh, 12 of September, 1921. And uh, that didn't come out well enough for you to read it, and well, I was able to read it. Um, and I've got it singled out because there's an incredible note in this, this about um, Sykes requesting Bovey to go get a couple of good barrel cacti, he calls them bisnavas, good big bisnavas, um, and then ship them out to New York. So he and a Mr. Kenny, I'm not sure who that was, went across the Rito and they found two. They took out the uh, 
something boxes, suitable boxes, suitable boxes, thank you, and pack them up. Um, and say, we had some job in loading them, as you can know, when I give you the weight. One was 620 pounds, <laughs> the other one 575 pounds. Crazy. They are both fine specimens and both um, have flowers on them. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see them up again, he says, and, and uh, I think it's going to be some job because he doesn't think people are going to be too experienced in New York at setting up, that's the verb he used, the setting up cactus. Uh, but later on in another letter, McDougall lets him know that they arrived in New York safely and everything's fine and the cacti are, are in good health. Um, and then comes the final note, the really priceless final note to me. The bricklayers are beginning on the walls of my new house this morning. Sincerely, the R. Bovey. I guess the Bovey family had had surely enough of tents. 